Hello, this is Peter Baxter, Editor of Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology, introducing our podcast for July 2014. In it, we'll be discussing the paper Benign Hereditary Career Related to NKX 2.1, Expansion of the Genotypic and Phenotypic Spectrum, which is by Catherine Peel and colleagues. It's going to be discussed by Catherine Peel, who's an SPR in Adult Neurology, at the MRC Center for Neuropsychiatric Genetics and Genomics, Institute of Psychological Medicine and Clinical Neurosciences, Cardiff University, Wales, and by Dr. James Rice, consultant in Pediatric Rehabilitation Medicine, Pediatric Rehabilitation Department, Women's and Children's Hospital, Adelaide, Australia, who's also written a commentary on the article. Please, can we start with you, Catherine, to outline the paper and its background? We um, wrote a paper based on a cohort of benign hereditary career patients, So benign hereditary career is a childhood onset hyperkinetic disorder with a a non-progressive career and no marked cognitive impairment. And our aim was to collect a cohort of these patients with the NKX 2.1 mutation and to characterize them and phenotype them from a motor perspective, a non-motor perspective, and also look at treatment paradigms that had been used and whether or not any of these had been particularly successful. The NKX2.1 gene is quite an interesting gene because it encodes for a thyroid transcription factor protein, which is not only involved in neurological embryogenesis, but also in lung and thyroid embryogenesis. And so this condition is sometimes known as the brain-lung thyroid disorder. And so we were also interested in the coexistence of any thyroid or respiratory problems and uh, at what rate these occurred within this cohort. So, uh, Catherine, this is a very interesting paper. Perhaps just to begin with, I'd like to ask you a little bit about your perspectives on the prevalence of the condition and what really drew you to an interest in wanting to uh, research this further. It began as part of my PhD project, which was based on hyperkinetic movement disorders in children. And I'd spent several years collecting a cohort throughout from the UK and from Ireland. And we genotyped all these cases and picked up three cases with NKX 2.1 mutations within this cohort. And then we're really lucky in the UK within the British Pediatric Neurology Association that there's an email pool uh, to be able to highlight that you've identified cases like this and whether or not anyone else has similar cases. So myself and Manju Kurian managed to identify seven other cases to put together this cohort of um, 10 cases. And I was particularly interested in the motor features of these disorder and how differential diagnosis was difficult and what other conditions that they could be particularly confused with or could make diagnosis difficult. You obviously relied on then a lot of collaboration with other centres across the UK and Ireland. Was that particularly difficult or was it because of the fact that you had this professional group through the Neurology Association that it made that quite feasible? Yes, I mean, I I think the association group is very helpful and they have a particular movement disorder subgroup which is uh, meet several times a year and that's an opportunity to highlight work like this. And actually everyone was very helpful, very forthcoming with information and I did my best to see as many of the patients as possible. I think I saw five of them in the end but we had video footage from the other centres as well and then a, a standard pro forma that I'd put together in terms of data collection. So actually getting the information together was very straightforward and it was great to collaborate with such a a broad group of individuals. Let's talk a little bit about the clinical assessment then. It's obviously very important in assessing children and adolescents and even adults who may have movement disorders to to take a rigorous and even standardised approach. Could you just describe in some details how you went about evaluating these children from a clinical perspective? A lot of the data, in fact, was collected retrospectively, so particularly information about age at onset and the nature of the motor symptoms at onset. So that particular data was collected from clinical notes and clinic letters, which in all of the cases had been done by pediatricians. So we felt that that was um, good, accurate information. Sometimes I think parental recall of exact age of onset was difficult and there was potentially a bit of recall bias, but that element of the work was reasonably rigorous. All the patients then had a videotaped assessment to look at their current symptoms or their current motor features to look at whether there'd been any change or any progression or development of new symptoms from that at onset. 
Um, and then in terms of non-motor features or additional clinical characteristics, then we were reliant on the clinician in their assessment. And from experience, pediatricians are excellent generalists as well. And so their picking up of the non-neurological features came through in the clinic letters. In terms of looking at the brain and thyroid involvement, I think because of the recognition that this disorder does have those components, most of the patients had been thoroughly tested at diagnosis for those concomitant symptoms. And in, in regard to the genetic evaluation, is there anything particular about the type of gene testing or sequencing that was performed here that you could elaborate on? So, yes, so within our research laboratory, we performed direct sequencing or Sanger sequencing, which is just placing a primer on the DNA and looking at the sequence of the gene and looking for any alterations to that that might change in the coding of the protein. That method doesn't always detect um, any deletions or any missing bits of DNA or any duplications for that matter. So in several of the centers where there was a, a high suspicion of the clinical phenotype, patients had a specific sort of MLPA, which is a specific technique looking for deletions and duplications, or a microarray, which shows uh, detects much larger deletions or duplications. And in uh, two of the cases, that picked up large gene deletions that covered both the NKX2.1 gene, but also some neighboring genes as well. Let's move a little bit now towards some of the clinical features, particularly the motor features of these uh, children and young people. And I certainly get the sense from your paper that when you really start evaluating and looking for motor features, there's really quite some diversity within the group. Would you like to discuss beyond the features of career what else you found and what that represented? Yes, no, I think what was really interesting is that the majority, in fact, eight of the ten patients presented initially with hypotonia. And looking back through their workup, a lot were evaluated for muscular or neuromuscular disorders. And then in infancy, um, demonstrating delayed motor milestones. It wasn't until sort of later childhood that maybe the career and then other movement disorders became more prominent. So we observed sort of later on myoclonus in half of the cases, again, dystonia in over half, and then to a lesser extent, some ataxia and tremor. And what was really quite remarkable is for a small number, three in our case, who then progressed into adolescence, for two of them, the career wasn't the predominant feature any longer. It became much less. And in fact, from a functional perspective, the myoclonus and dystonia were much more disabling. There was one case, however, where the career had become more prominent. But I think if we look at other literature in the same area, in particular a paper from a French group last year, there did seem to be this pattern of, of lessening of the career through adolescence and into adulthood with other motor features becoming more prominent, which is very interesting in itself. One of the things I found interesting in your paper was that almost two-thirds of the cohort was female, which tends to really ride against what is typical in neurodisability in childhood, and that's a male predominance. Do you have any views on that? Yeah, we were quite interested by this and whether or not there had been any recruitment bias, and we looked back at previous literature. And there aren't many larger cohorts or case series on this topic, but those that did, and particularly I, I refer back to the Grass et al. paper from uh, 2013, there was a female predominance then as well. We didn't have the opportunity to look as to whether or not this was due to variable penetrance or due to imprinting methods. There certainly doesn't seem to be a strong evidence for either of those, but this tendency towards female predominance probably indicates that a little bit more work needs to be done looking at whether or not there are any other genetic factors which influence gender distribution in this disorder. Moving on now to discuss some of the non-motor features, one of the things that's really interesting about this is the further you look, the more you find, particularly in regard to the hypothyroidism, but also, I guess, the heterogeneity of respiratory involvement. What did you find in particular in regard to those two areas? So in terms of the thyroid involvement, most of this, again, had been tested in the neonatal or infancy period, and we had four patients who had a form of thyroid dysfunction. So we had um, three with congenital hypothyroidism and one with subclinical hypothyroidism, so underactive um, thyroid activity in all of the cases. A same number had a respiratory involvement. Two had infant respiratory distress syndrome requiring hospital admission and one required level three care, so intensive care admission. Two others had recurrent lower respiratory tract infections, 
which I imagine in isolation a lot of children have no respiratory tract infections. So we used a minimum of three episodes that acquired antibiotics with or without a hospital admission to characterize that over and above what would be expected within the background population. Our rates of identifying lung and thyroid involvement are slightly lower than has been reported previously. Most cohorts have reported over half, so ours just under. But that probably reflects to a degree our recruitment bias in that our patients had all come through a neurology service and we hadn't gone and tried to identify patients either through respiratory or an endocrinological service. Beyond the respiratory and thyroid involvement, there's some description of quite a diverse range of other features. In particular, you note that none of the patients had marked cognitive impairment and they were in mainstream education. Do you have any thoughts, given some of the uh, findings made by other authors in this regard, where you might go in terms of further evaluation of a similar cohort in the future? In terms of any um, specific learning difficulties or even in regard to functional difficulties they may have in, in terms of behaviour, such as in the areas of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or even obsessive compulsive disorder? I mean, I think that's one of the major criticisms of this work is that we didn't use any systematic or standardised questionnaire um, tools in order to assess cognition and any coexistent psychiatric symptoms. We identified the features within this cohort mainly through routine clinical assessment. And I think if we compare our work to other cohorts in which they did use systematic questionnaires, there was a higher rate of a milder cognitive impairment being identified. Yes, all of our cohorts were in mainstream education, but we could have explored that in greater detail, looking to see whether there were any milder intellectual impairments or executive functioning difficulties, which may not be apparent immediately during clinical assessment or even during schooling. I think as well, the majority of our cohorts were in junior education in, in the UK, so under eight, aged 11, and maybe hadn't been through some of the more rigorous testing of academia, and that maybe some of these features might become highlighted within their education later on. In terms of the attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, the French paper certainly found a high number of seven cases then with, with these symptoms. Overtly, again, none of these cases were found to have those sort of symptoms in clinical assessment. But I wonder whether if we'd performed some systematic questionnaire, whether we might have picked up some more subtle features. And certainly with any future work within these type of patients, then I think uh, use of those questionnaires or assessment tools and bringing in a, a psychologist as well would be very helpful in determining the more subtle features that can coexist along with this movement disorder. Yes, I think that's a great idea in terms of looking in more depth in the future. I'm very interested in now the pharmacological treatment that was, was used and particularly what was the rationale between what type of medication to use in what situation. You describe a number of medications that were used and uh, you evaluated for their outcome. How did you decide on the medication to use and in particular how were you trying to quantify the uh, effect of the medication treatment? Yeah, so this is quite difficult because all the medication had been started by the individual clinician looking after the case. So one center, there were three cases from a single center, but otherwise each case was treated in a different center. So partly this was meant to be a useful tool for other clinicians potentially if they were having difficulty treating these cases to look and to see what sort of response that we'd had within the cohort and also to see whether we could identify any patterns that may be useful in developing some sort of treatment paradigm for these cases. I think what was notable is that not all patients were treated. I think that mainly reflected the degree of functional disability and I think if, if between clinician and parent or guardian and patient that they felt they, the indication for treatment wasn't required at that point then those are the main reasons why patients weren't treated. For those that were treated on the whole career in particular had a very poor response to the therapies that were tried. Levodopa was without doubt the most commonly tried therapy mainly because there were dystonic components and, of course, the concern over missing a dopa-responsive dystonia. In comparison with other studies um, who have reported improvements with levodopa, one of the limitations of our work is maybe that we didn't, our, the patients within our cohort didn't reach the doses that other people had used, mainly because of intolerance of side effects. Clonazepam and trihexafenadyl did have some improvements to the career, 
but certainly didn't um, totally remove those sort of symptoms. What we didn't do and what we'd be interested in is to look at the impact of these therapies on the other features. So whether or not the degree of improvement to the myoclonus or to the dystonia, as well as the career. And our sort of determinant of improvement was just whether the clinician and the patient and their family felt that overall there had been some degree of functional improvement, be that um, moderate, mild, or, or marked. So it was certainly wasn't entirely robust, but it was an opportunity to take a look at these. Another interesting feature was the one case with obsessive-compulsive disorder. That patient had been started on some trihexyphenidyl with the aim of treating dystonia and, to a lesser degree, the chorea, and the obsessive-compulsive symptoms improved remarkably with this treatment. And in fact, this patient was taking part in um, external exams at school at the time, and this treatment provided significant benefit for what would have been a very difficult period for them. One of the things that interests me is how you can apply measurement tools in this sort of population where you've got some diversity of movement patterns and obviously intentions of both the treating clinician and the family to see improvement. And I think uh, the reality is there are very few few tools that are tailored in terms of uh, being able to apply to such a rare condition. I wondered about whether there are even uh, measurement tools available in other situations such as in cerebral palsy research that can be applied. Uh, I just wonder what your thoughts were about and looking beyond into other populations with the aim of trying to provide some more robust measurement and outcomes in these sorts of situations, whether you have since come across anything else that could be relevant to this group? Certainly my background, it was in sort of myoclonus dystonia um, type disorders, but certainly in, in that area, which is slightly more common than the benign hereditary career, there's work being done um, in conjunction with occupational therapists and physiotherapists assessing baseline function with a greater emphasis on day-to-day -day and academic motor and non-motor function and how therapies beyond just oral medical therapies can be used particularly physiotherapy paradigms, to try and improve functional outcomes for these patients. And particularly from an academic point of view, because irrespective of cognitive involvement or not, the motor disorder often impacts upon learning tasks within the classroom and ability to do that, and looking at ways, either alternative ways of being able to interact in the classroom environment all by using uh, physiotherapy measures or occupational therapy tools to improve writing, improve computer use, and in that sort of field. I think there are several systematic assessment tools that are, that are used for that. Um, I, they differ slightly between the different centers, but that sort of more functional assessment, I think, is, uh, would be particularly interesting in these patients and also could provide a much more pragmatic in view of the very poor response from the oral therapy that would really help these children as they go through their schooling and move into adolescence. Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head as far as the, the to grapple the issues is much greater than just what you can achieve in the clinic. And I very much enjoy that idea of looking more broadly in terms of their functional impairments and what difficulties they may be experiencing either at school or elsewhere in their lives and how you know the role of therapy is really quite a powerful role in how it's not just about what doctors can do with prescription in the clinic but uh, how others within the broader network and particularly involving therapists can assist. So I think that's a really important point. I'd like to ask you a bit now about this, um, I guess this really unique aspect of this condition is that it has this reassuring overall name of benign hereditary career but when we start to look more deeply into this with the work that you've done realize that it may not well be benign and in fact beyond the career there are other things that are probably more concerning. Why do you think this career may you know, wax and wane and then uh, other features of uh, the motor disorder which may be apparent early become more prominent and may even persist? What, what are your thoughts on, I guess, what might be the basis of this and, and indeed where this sort of condition goes beyond the paediatric clinic into adulthood? I think that's very interesting and certainly it's a similar pattern that I've seen when I was looking at these, the other hyperkinetic disorders during my previous work and I wonder whether uh, what we're observing is a degree of neuronal plasticity and development of the child brain as they progress through childhood and into adolescence and whether 
particularly with likely involvement of basal ganglia networks involving of the prefrontal cortex and whether plasticity and development and maybe overuse with certain movement disorders leads to development of, of new pathways or aberrant pathways that then give rise to a change in the predominant symptomatology. I think um, certainly one of the cases now I see in an adult clinic, and the career is very mild, and yet going back to childhood was really quite predominant and affected gait. And I, I do wonder whether this is a predominant plasticity disorder and whether if uh, sort of imaging studies looking at brain volumes and changes in a brain architecture with more high level functional imaging whether we would start to see changes if you followed these children up longitudinally over time and what that meant for their adult brain in comparison with childhood imaging. Absolutely, and you talk about plasticity and you also talk about how disabling early on the career can be. Did you get any sense that beyond the motor disorder there may actually be some sensory dysfunction in these children? I think certainly because the cases that we observed who had some ataxia, there were question marks over whether it certainly didn't look like a cerebellar ataxia and whether or not there was a sensory component there that gave it a degree of clumsiness. I, I think that's not a particularly scientific term, but I think that was probably a more accurate description of the motor patterns of these children. And that, together with the hypotonia that was seen during childhood, I think that there, there probably was a degree, or at least in some of these patients, a, um, a significant sensory contribution, which may give rise to this sort of spectrum of phenotypes that we see from the motor perspective. Certainly. One of the challenges in this type of condition, I think, is that it is such a rare condition yet to actually try and further pinpoint the prevalence in the greater population is very difficult. From your experience and from the work of your colleagues as part of this neurology group, do you have any thoughts on going forward ways that you may be able to formalise case identification? And you'd be aware that I suggested even the idea of a registry being established for these rare disorders and how that might uh, come into play? Yeah, so I think there's probably two areas where these type of disorders, these seemingly rare disorders, over the next couple of years, our recognition of them and identification is going to improve. I think one element is that more and more centres are using gene chips now rather than the clinician having to select individual genes to be tested. And I think inevitably that sometimes throws up some surprises. And so I think we might see that we will start to identify more and more of these cases because certainly this gene is included on most, if not all, childhood hyperkinetic panels and also dystonia panels as well now. In terms of registry, I know within the UK, the Pediatric Movement Disorders Group are looking to really develop a, a central database for registration of all rare hyperkinetic disorders so that these cases can be followed up longitudinally. We have a better understanding of what takes place, but also for studies like this, should a particular group develop an interest that there are a cohort of patients already established who can be identified and that real progress can be made in this area in whatever means, whether that takes on an imaging study or a physiotherapy treatment paradigm study or anything of that nature. I think the combination of those two factors will improve identification and also allow more coherent study of these rare disorders. And I think in addition to that, if you do have more consistent identification methods and, and registries that allow for surveillance, you know, prospective management, the, the other goal needs to be that you ameliorate the condition that ideally through earlier intervention and strategies that are really, you know, across the disciplines that you are impacting on the outcome of this condition and changing its natural history. Yes, definitely. I mean, obviously, in some childhood hyperkinetic disorders, there's a move now towards early intervention with, say, deep brain stimulation. Whether or not that would be appropriate in, in this disorder, I'm uncertain. I, I'm not aware of any cases, or well, none of the cases in this cohort has undergone DBS. But also, it provides an opportunity, moving back to the plasticity and, and sensory input that could potentially underpin this disorder, if early therapy intervention that may be able to alter some of that progression could have a significant impact on the later progression of the disorder and some of the more adolescent and adult-type features that appear.
I suspect some of these children were already receiving early therapy, weren't they? But it may not have been apparent what was the underlying yeah. basis for their condition. So that knowing what the condition is through earlier genotyping and other identification should provide additional benefit to their outlook. Yes, I think so. And I think particularly therapists who have a particular interest in these disorders, if there were specific paradigms or specific tools that were found to be helpful, then early implementation of those because of early identification would certainly be beneficial to all of the patients, I think. Well, that was a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much. It adds a lot of interest to an already interesting article. We've now come to the end of our podcast. Many thanks indeed to Dr. Peel and Dr. Rice for that very relevant and wide-ranging discussion. Just to remind our listeners, the article is Benign Hereditary Career Related to NKX 2.1, Expansion of the Genotypic and Phenotypic Spectrum by Peel et al. in the July 2014 issue.